What's up guys, McJippin here, back with another reaction video. Uh, one of the comments on one of my past videos uh, was to check out this video, Ancient Rome in 20 Minutes. Uh, I'm excited for this one. It is uh, because I don't know, um, I know, I like to think I know a good amount of history, more so in some, uh, you know, around like World War II, World War One, maybe a bit in the 1800s, not great, but Rome I'm really not that great with. Um, and uh, I'm excited for this. Uh, it's much longer than my usual videos. I'm gonna try and not pause and talk so much so I don't make it like a 40 minute, an hour video. So thanks for the recommendation. Um, ready to learn about Rome, let's do it. Here are the letters the Romans gave us. I got to make sure, especially because this is such a long video that I'm recording. Good, you can see me. Um, Obviously, there's a glare, uh, but okay. Let's whose languages derive from Latin. Today, they cover half the world. As for the ancient Romans, the boundaries Canada, of their state encompassed their entire Quebec. civilization. The Roman peace, or Pax Romana, serves as the first example of globalization. Let's take a walk across 12 centuries of the Roman history. And yes, those numerals are also a Roman legacy. Rome in 20 minutes. What is Rome? A city on seven hills, capital of Italy. But that is today. And 2,000 years ago, there it is. Another thousand years ago, there. A tiny tribal settlement of the Latins by the river Tiber. How did this manage to conquer the world? First, it was lucky with its neighbors. To the north, the Etruscans... Already amazing video. Great. Already I can tell I'm uh, really learn a lot and really well put together. In Tuscany, a mysterious people whose language has never been fully deciphered. To the south, Greek colonies. These peoples all traded with each other. It was at the crossroads of their trade routes that Rome appeared. From the very start, Rome has been an open city, a safe haven for outcasts, murderers, runaway slaves. Rome offered migrants a unique opportunity to become fully-fledged citizens. This will make Rome the largest metropolitan city of the ancient world. The Romans themselves believed they were descendants of refugees from the Middle East who had survived the Trojan War. Romulus and Remus were the great-grandchildren of the Trojan hero Aeneas. Nursed by an Italian she-wolf, the brothers quarreled where to site the future world capital. Romulus killed Remus, gave his name to the city, and became its first ruler. As legend has it, there were seven kings, each of which enjoyed a lengthy reign and left some beneficial legacy. A calendar, a sewer system, or the Capitolium, a temple to the senior god Jupiter. Much of what the Romans later became famous for, aqueducts, bridges, perhaps even the gladiatorial games, were borrowed from the Etruscans. This people had invented the Latin alphabet by adapting... There's so many of these things, like I want to go look up, you know, Etruscan, I want to go look up... I just... I. I want to just sit through the video, enjoy it, and uh, later I might go back through it and maybe look look up some of the stuff I don't uh, know fully about. The Greek letters for their own needs. It's not surprising that their last kings were Etruscan. Rome borrowed her military Whoa, and government check out organization the from them, that guy. while maintaining her stern. You see that guy's nose? Whoa! Rome borrowed her military and government organization from them while maintaining her stern patriarchal simplicity. In 509, Rome was shaken by a sex scandal. The son of King Tarquin the Proud raped the chaste Lucretia. Tarquin was expelled, making him the last king of Rome. The Romans decided to prevent any such concentration of power ever again. From 509 onwards, they elected two consuls to serve a year apiece, instead of a monarch. One year. The consuls were controlled by the Senate. This consisted of 300 fathers, patris in Latin, hence the term patricians. Those not so lucky to be born into the right families joined the plebs. Even if they were as rich as patricians, they were not entitled to take up positions in the state. It is in the 200-year struggle for these rights that the Republic, literally meaning public thing, will be formed. The plebeians would make up the backbone of the army, and to have their own way, they would threaten the fledgling state with emigration to a neighboring hill. 
Each time, the scared patricians caved in, introducing, for instance, the special position of a representative or tribune of the plebeians. These had the right to veto any decisions of the consuls. One of the main achievements of the struggle was the publication of the first written laws. By 287 BC, the plebeians had achieved complete equality of rights with the patricians. The unity of Rome found its best expression in the formula Senatus Populusque Romanus, the Senate and the Roman people, which still adorns the manhole covers in Rome. I'd like to go to Italy. What? In 390 BC, I've the history of Rome could have come to an Austria. end. The city was unexpectedly taken by the Gauls. The guard dogs had sensed no danger, for which they would be crucified every year since. Geese awoke the last protectors of the Capitoline Hill fortress instead, saving what? Rome from complete destruction. The shaken Romans conducted a military reform. The Roman legion was divided into manipuli, making it more mobile in battle. The Roman army spent the next hundred years in constant wars. Instead of simply imposing a tribute on the conquered, the Romans would enter into a treaty of alliance with them. And the loyal allies supply Rome with a never-ending stream of recruits. Thanks to this, the Roman legions were able to stand their ground in battle with the most efficient fighting force of the time. The all-conquering Macedonian phalanx, led by Pyrrhus, a relative of Alexander the Great. The last stronghold of resistance in Italy, the Greek city of Tarentum, then hired the most costly and celebrated contemporary warlord of the time to defend against Roman expansion. Having conquered Tarentum and reached Sicily, Rome now had to take on a much more dangerous adversary, Carthage, lord of the Mediterranean. Hannibal. The Romans called the Phoenicians of Carthage Punics, hence the Punic Wars. They were fought over the next hundred years. In 149 BC, Rome had taken the greater part of Punic territory and that of their allies. But after each defeat, the trading power of Carthage would rapidly recover. Senator Cato, the elder, began to finish every speech with the same refrain, Carthage must be destroyed. And so it was done. The city was wiped out, all of its population was enslaved, allegedly plowing salt into the air as an eternal curse. Also in 146 BC, the Romans wiped out another city, Corinth, making Greece and Macedonia Roman provinces. Rome appropriated the colossal riches of the disintegrating empire of Alexander, but the patriarchal simplicity of Rome succumbed to the sophisticated Greek culture. Greek became, in effect, a second state language. The Roman nobility busied itself learning new words, hexameter, history, rhetoric. Cicero, the most famed orator of Rome, would come to model his speeches on those of the Greek Demosthenes. However, across this immense territory, full rights were only afforded to the Romans themselves. Even other Italians, the majority of the military, had no citizenship rights. These would demand equality, declare war, and win the right to take part in managing the state. This was a total game changer. While ancient Greece remained a collection of squabbling city-states, Rome gradually extended citizenship rights to the conquered, laying down the bases for an empire. Having conquered half the world, Rome fell victim to globalization, cheap grain, okay, and conquered so, half a little recap. Um, what was it? They say the first one. All right, I'm at 713. I'm at 713. So 390 BC to 146 BC was really just Rome coming out of this little thing and starting its journey to become what it is, you know, when BC turns to CE. Um... And then, uh, 714. Okay. And then we get here where they've, you know, they fought with Carthage. And I'm assuming now they're going to be, the borders are going to start to shape into what we think of as a Roman Empire. Having conquered half the world, Rome fell victim to globalization. Cheap grain and an inflow of unpaid slave labor bankrupted the small farmers. These rushed into the cities and joined the ranks of the proletariat, those who have nothing to lose except their own offspring. 
At the same time, the rich grew a hundred times richer, having bought land from the ruined peasants for a song. Previously united, the Senate and the Roman people split into two hostile camps. The tribunes of the people, the Gracchi brothers, would try to reconcile them. They proposed granting excess public lands to the impoverished peasants and suggested free distributions of bread to the poor. The disgruntled senators decided to suppress the Gracchi movement by force, killing the brothers and several thousand of their allies. Rome was gripped by civil wars. Social mobility for the proletariat was offered by Gaius Marius, a popular general. He began enrolling the proletariat. People are pretty awesome in that. Um, it's kind of, you know, there's would you rather be feared or loved? And um, there's only so much kind of fear you can put in to someone and make their lives so miserable until they just don't care anymore and they just go after you and... Um, either they get killed or they overthrow you and um, I think that's common around the world with civilizations in that it's really cool to see or to learn in history just how strong we are and how we persevere as um, as people and even an extreme hardship and uh, it's cool very very cool Proletariat into the army with a promise of a grant of land at the end of service. This would make the legions personally devoted to their generals. In 49 BC, two outstanding generals fought over Rome. Gnaeus Pompeius had won the eastern provinces for Rome, including restless Judea, cleared the Mediterranean of piracy, defeated Spartacus' slave revolt, and justifiably added the title great okay so for the first few hundred years it's your basic building blocks of small rome into a more recognizable map of rome fighting and defeating carthage then it moved on to them breaking apart a bit um in the latter years of bc uh like uh you know 75 bc and the power is there and now they're fighting over it and uh, obviously Jesus comes in in a few decades to see what happens to his name Gaius Julius Caesar had conquered Gaul nowadays they would call it genocide he butchered a million Gauls and enslaved as many more he went on to defeat the Germans and then invaded Britain uh, I'm um, uh, I know my parents side came from my mom's side are French Canadian? I know that I have French in me, English, and Irish. I think mostly English, but I'm not uh, sure, so I'm sure my ancestors are uh, somewhere over here. According to the law, a general had to dismiss his legions before returning to Rome and in return have his moment of glory, a triumphal entry into the capital to the applause of the citizens. Caesar performed a hitherto unseen maneuver. He refused to submit to the Senate, and having crossed the Italian border, the river Rubicon, marched his legions to Rome. It would take him several years to defeat Pompey the Great and his other rivals, pitting Roman legions against each other. In the process, Caesar annexed new territories, and gave Cleopatra the Egyptian throne. After a romantic cruise along the Nile, she would give birth to Caesarion, or Little Caesar. That's crazy. On his return, Caesar would it's add... so crazy. When you think of Cleopatra, you think of before... I, I think of, stupidly, obviously, I think of before this, the times of the pyramids, but um, there's a cool fact how uh, we are... I hope I'm right about this. We are closer in time to when Cleopatra was alive this time than we are than Cleopatra was to the building of the first pyramids. That's pretty crazy. I hope that's true. So um, don't quote me on that. Imperator or emperor to his name, title originally meaning victorious commander, and gained control of all political positions: consul, tribune of the people, and dictator. Rumor spread that Caesar wanted to declare himself king. Conspiracy was brewing in the Senate, and Caesar was assassinated. Caesar left his wealth, quite unexpectedly for all concerned, to his grand nephew, 
19 year old Gaius Octavius. This Octavian immediately joined in the power struggle in 31 BC. So they had like legal wills and everything like that? Because I'm assuming when they assassinated him, it was a, they killed him on the spot. There wasn't like a time where it was like, I'm giving everything to you. So that's interesting. He defeated his last rival. So that was a big civil war in the budding of the big Roman kingdom. Caesar wins it over, what was it, Pompeius? Um, hooks up with Cleopatra, which is pretty insane. And um, that's over. So the building stages are going. The civil war stages of who's going to control the big, powerful Roman Empire that we know of his, in history. And uh, now Caesar is killed, and uh, we have this guy. Um, I'm curious about when, uh, you know, the whole... I wonder how long it took for between Jesus dying and there being, you know, the religion about Jesus. That's interesting. The warlord Mark I think Anthony, they'll touch on that. Who much. likewise had an affair with Cleopatra. The lovers would take their own lives. Octavian was left so Romeo and Juliet. of a vast territory. Julius Caesar ruled for four years. Octavian, assuming the title Augustus, meaning the venerable or the great, ruled for an endless 43 years. He didn't formally abolish the Republic. He simply took control of all possible positions, making his power almost absolute. But he modestly called himself Princeps, the first senator. And even though skirmishes with barbarians continued along the borders, inside them, the period of Pax Romana set in, a period of peace and stability that was to last 200 years. The empire experienced... So Pax, insert whatever, I, know, like, I hear Pax Br Britannica. I think we're technically sort of in a Pax Americana, or at least the past, like, 70 years, or since World War II, is just when... There is a empire that is just so dominant and unchallenged that there's sort of peace. I mean, you can't stand up to them. It's just, it's so stupid to stand up to them. And if you get involved with anything else or someone else that, that um, affects them, they're going to get into it. And so it's when something, uh, civilization is so powerful where really nothing can challenge it and there aren't that many huge wars economic upswing. Bread was distributed for free to 200,000 people. On Augustus' orders, a 500-meter basin was dug at the very center of the capital, where 3,000 gladiators mimicked sea battles on real seagoing vessels. In Rome, construction was booming. Concrete and multi-story districts were growing. Augustus had to introduce height regulations, limiting skyscrapers to six floors. And still the citizens were unhappy. They complained about traffic jams, pollution of the waters of the Tiber, and high rents. The golden century of poetry dawned. Mycenaeus, a quasi-minister of culture... I love how... Oh, I'm pausing too much. I love how when there's no kind of Pax fill in the blank, there's all this, this terrible stuff, uh, you know, wars and death and disease and all this uh, brutality. And then when we get into a sort of peace... People are so funny, man. We, we just find problems in other things, and uh, I, I'm not saying one's, I'm not saying it's worse than uh, there not being peace, but I just find that everyone's lives are filled with problems that were never supposed to be the forefront, I guess. Allocated special grants to praise the value of the state. Temples would be built in the honor of Augustus, and even a month was named after him. Thus, the cult of the Roman emperors was emerging. They would come to be venerated alongside Mars and Jupiter. Jesus? After Augustus' power became hereditary, the senatorial opposition has left us vivid portraits of the first emperors. Suspicious Tiberius unleashed terror under the pretext of the law on treason. Under this law, any action could be deemed offensive. It was enough not to sufficiently praise the emperor or pay at a brothel with coins bearing his portrait. In distant Judea, a preacher refusing to worship the emperor. This one, the one with me 
with either two naked women or me with a naked woman. In distant Judea, a preacher refusing to worship the emperor as God was crucified. Jesus! Caligula wanted to make his horse a consul. A scholar and gourmet, Claudius, was too occupied with feasting and the reforming of the alphabet to keep an eye on court intrigue. One of his wives, Messalina, was giving women of easy virtue a run for their money in the brothel. And the other, Agrippina, poisoned Claudius with mushrooms to enthrone her son from another marriage, Nero. Nero, believing that he was a boy. I wonder if that's just kind of like a painting style to make him more like womanly, or if like they always had to like have one boob out at all times. Oh <laughs> uh, god, because I mean, with the man, you have them with their like sculpted penis. <laughs> Not an emperor would later kill his own mother, and then allegedly the apostles Peter and Paul. Then he again allegedly set fire to Rome. Allegedly, so read the verses on the fall of Troy during the blaze. He would accuse the first Christians of arson, and initiated their persecution. And finally, he took his own life. Most details of this era are known from Tacitus, Not a historian and senator who the observed the degradation guy. of republican institutions. Fate of the empire was now decided not so much by the Senate as by the Praetorian Guards, the emperor's personal security force, created back in the times of Augustus. These suffocated Tiberius with a cushion, slayed Caligula by the sword, and hailed Claudius emperor. In all fairness, at the same time, the empire grew, expanding into new territories. Roman legions conquered part of Britain, where the empire grew, expanding into new territories. Roman legions conquered part of Britain, where they founded a town called Londinium. Provinces were given a transparent taxation system, really? and the non-Roman nobility began to enter the Senate en masse. A grandchild of an Italian peasant, Vespasian Flavius, would become the founder of the next dynasty. Vespasian and Titus, suppressing the uprising in Judea, committed genocide, again according to modern day, not Roman standards, and reduced the Temple of Jerusalem to nothing but the Wailing Wall. On a lighter note, Vespasian had a jolly good Roman predisposition. He taxed the collectors of Urim he made the toilets? toilets. He taxed Roman predisposition. He taxed the collectors of Urim at the public toilets. He taxed the collectors of urine at public toilet? You mean, does that mean it costs money to use the toilet or you use taxpayer money to build the toilets separately? And Titus, the destroyer of Jerusalem, Either way, nevertheless doesn't. obtained the title of merciful. After a splendid triumph... When you think of it, dealing with waste, is it's gotta be the... When you get all, so many people a lot of other things figured out. It's it's so important, and um, the larger the city, the more impressive uh, the sewage sewage system is going to be. So the Colosseum for the people, Titus would be called the love and consolation of humankind. And after such festivities had depleted the public treasury, Vesuvius destroyed Pompeii, plague devastated half Italy, and Titus became a god. The, height of Empire the second century would go down in history as the era of the good emperors. Trajan was considered by his contemporaries the best emperor ever. It's funny how, uh, you know, I was talking about, you know, when Jesus comes out and they talked about him for a second. And, uh, um, you know, he's so probably the most famous name in the world. And uh, it showed, like, if you were to go back to his time, nobody would know who really... You know really who he is and by glossing it over like that it does a great job the video of just showing how you know, this wasn't that m huge of an event at the time Rome became a million strong city and the Empire reached its largest extent Rome connected on new territories via a network of paved roads this system still determines the transport map of Europe after Trajan's conquest, Hadrian busied himself with defense, erecting Hadrian's massive fortifications in Britain and between the Rhine and the Danube. Pantheon was built in Rome, the first temple to be topped by a massive dome, a real architectural sensation of the day, dedicated to all the gods. Hadrian would also include his lover among them, the young Antinius. More of his images have survived than of any Roman. 
The last good emperor of just have survived. He had a boy than of any it doesn't look like a woman. That looks like a woman. Roman. The last good emperor, the throned philosopher, Marcus Aurelius, would spend most of his reign on military expeditions. In between battles, he wrote his manifesto for Stoic philosophy, Meditations. Western Serv. It was under Marcus Aurelius's son, Commodus, that the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, came to an end. He preferred a gladiator's glory to the affairs so of state. So this is that movie Gladiator with Russell Crowe. This is that time. At the height. Came to an end. So Marcus Aurelius' son, Commodus, that the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, came to an end. He preferred a gladiator's glory to the affairs of state. Conspirators had the emperor strangled by a fellow fighter, the slave Narcissus. Rome sank into chaos. The next hundred years brought a sequence of random emperors proclaimed by the army, taking their turn on the throne, were a liberated slave, a fortune seeker who bought the throne at an auction, general Punic descent who would place statues of the former enemy, Hannibal all over the empire, a Syrian priest of the sun, and a former shepherd who owed his popularity to his powerful physique. In 212, Emperor Caracalla, half North African, half Syrian, granted Roman citizenship to nearly all free subjects of the empire. The idea that you could be a Roman in Judea, in Africa, or any other corner of the empire at all might well be the main legacy of Rome still in use today. By mid-century, Rome was already in the midst of such a crisis that the whole... It's really a smart idea. It might seem counterintuitive at first, especially with the lifespan that a person has to see the big run. But um, at first you might think, well, if we give citizenship too far away from our original you know, Rome, then the empire won't really be Roman anymore. But if, they, if you don't do that, then if it gets too big, your chances of a mutiny, or not, not even a mutiny, just a a secession of some part that has enough power to to, to uh, defend itself goes way up. Uh, so that's really interesting to think about. Whole provinces were starting to split off. The Gauls, for instance, proclaimed an empire of their own. Order would be restored by the son of a liberated slave, Diocletian. Having started his career as a soldier, he would end up an absolute monarch, an astonishing example of social mobility. Diocletian split the empire into four, with four co-rulers at four capitals, situated closer to the frontier. Rome lost its significance. The Senate became a town council. The country was now ruled by an army of officials personally reporting to the emperor. Thus, the ancient world, centered around the concept of a free community and free citizens, came to an end. From the princeps, the first senator, the emperor had become the dominus a title by which slaves addressed their masters. The citizen became a subject, the warrior turned into a soldier, and the farmer a semi-serf. Diocletian himself resigned from the post of emperor 20 years later and went off to his estate to grow cabbages. After Diocletian's departure, the co-rulers were fighting for power. Constantine, the future Saint Constantine the Great, emerging victorious. Before the crucial battle for Rome, he allegedly had a vision of a cross. After this, he made all religions equal. After 300 years of persecutions, the Christians came out of the catacombs and were now entitled to build churches alongside the temples of Augustus and Mars. Constantine would take the cross from Jerusalem to the new capital of the Roman Empire, Constantinople. Theodosius I would make Christianity the official religion and begin... I'm so curious what Christians were like and what were they were doing between the death of Jesus and, you know, around year 400 or something. And what really led Constantine to uh, make it the official religion, which I know he ends up doing. Really interested about that to destroy the ancient temples. He would also be the last emperor of a united Roman Empire. His sons split the empire into west and east. The eastern half would live another thousand years. 
and is known to us as Byzantium. Yeah. The western part would fall victim to the great migration of people. France, pretty much. Rome, founded by migrants, would fall to the onslaught of a new wave of refugees. Ironically, the last ruler of Rome would be called Romulus. Great video. In modern Rome, not far from the Colosseum and the ruins of the Forum, there is a tomb. Its occupant was neither emperor nor senator, but a simple baker called Eurysakis. Likely born a slave into a family of Greek migrants, he later entered into a bread supply contract with the capital and became so rich that he could build such a monument for himself and his wife. Before Rome, in ancient Egypt and elsewhere, or after Rome, during the Middle Ages, a man would die in the same station in life as he had been born in. The life and career of Eurysakis is an answer to the question of how Rome was able to create a global state that lasted over a thousand years. Such a great video. So good. Um... Yeah, um, it did. It did. It did just enough to make me want to dive in even deeper into certain parts of it to see, you know, more of what happened. Thanks so much for the recommendation. Um, yeah, this is a longer video than I usually do. Um, it was. It wasn't bad. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, that time flew by. And uh, yeah, let me you guys know in the comments if you want me to react to anything specific. And uh, maybe maybe I'll check it out. Uh, so yeah, see you guys till next time.